just before we start, I've got a bit of a beaver story as we're talking about beavers tonight. So when I was a student back in the 80s, I was working um, at Bishop Stortford in Hertfordshire and um, we had a call from the local RSPC inspector and he, um, he said, oh, we must come and look at this animal that I've found. And it was a North American beaver and it had just been found walking down the streets of Harlow. It's a slightly different species than what we're talking about later. It's um, Castor canadensis um, as opposed to the European beaver. Um, but um, nobody ever came forward and said that they'd lost a North American beaver. So there was then the problem of rehoming it. And we found a rehoming centre, but they said, we'll only take it if it's a male. And um, as we're going to find out, um, sexing beavers can be incredibly challenging. So more about that later. But um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our speaker for tonight, um, Jane Reeve. So Jane has got a very, very long um, experience history in conservation. She's worked in India with tigers and she's worked on um, primates in, in Java. And she's also worked in tur with turtles in um, Granada, I think. Um, but more recently, she's worked much closer to home. Um, and her main work now is flood management and um, forming habitats for washer voles, and more recently, beavers. Um, so Jane, I'm going to hand over to you. Hello, very nice to see everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and hope that this works really easily. Otherwise, it's going to be a bit of a dull talk. Here we go, and I'm going to just try and make this work. So I'm hoping that everyone can see this. If ever, somebody could yep. give me a thumbs up that yes, they've got yes, this. Great. That Thank is you. okay. That's that's absolutely perfect. Brilliant. Right. Um, so thank you for that introduction, um, Alison. So yes, I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle stop tour of water voles, ecology, behaviour, habitat, signs, threats, why they're endangered. Um, and then we're going to move to the project that I've most recently been working on, which is called Fixing and Linking Our Wetlands Project, which is an acronym is FLOW, which is much easier to say. Um, and then I'll just be touching on how the FLOW project was trying to mimic the work of beavers and how it is that beavers do adapt their environment for their needs and how important that is. Um, and then a little bit about flow habitat creation and flood risk reduction work. So they're kind of all interlinked. So I'm hoping it will flow fairly easily. Um, and we, yes, we're going to do questions in the chat, please, if you don't mind putting them in. And then um, I'll try and talk to them at the end, to, uh, get through them at the end. Um, I'm afraid I've got about 50 PowerPoint slides to get through. So I'm going to try not to do death by PowerPoint. Um, I've tried to put in lots of photos to keep everybody awake, a bit of film footage where I can. Um, and we'll just power through it so I can talk to you at the end. Okay, so first of all, I want to tell you a bit about water voles. I'm really passionate about water voles. I think they're brilliant. I love them and they are really important flagship species. Um, people are always surprised by how large a water vole is because they assume that it's about the same size as a bank vole or a field vole, but actually water voles are about the size of a guinea pig. So they're comparable with um, the brown rat and they quite often get confused with brown rats because they do overlap in their habitat. They're quite similar in colouring, um, but it stops there. Um, although they're both rodents, they look quite different in that rats have big ears and pink tails. Water voles have a very blunt nose. Their ears are quite hidden um, in their fur. Um, they have quite shiny beady eyes, but they have a fully uh, furred tail. So they are quite different. Um, in England, we have reddy brown coloured water voles, but actually in Scotland, they're black. And I've got a really lovely picture of a black water vole. Um, they look amazing as little black um, mammals. And this is because actually they colonise the UK um, at sl from slightly different parts of Europe. So the northern European uh, water voles are black. Um, the more southern colonised ones are um, from sort of France and Spain are brown. And they are the same species, they have the same genetic background and they can fully breed. And actually in Northern England, you do get both black and um, reddy brown water voles living side by side, mating and producing young. They just have this melanistic more colour um, in, in Scotland. 
Um, they do show some adaptations um, to swimming and being aquatic, um, and they have two types of guard hair, which ensure that they stay pretty warm uh, winter round using um, water, but they don't have any foot webbing. But their feet are proportionally bigger in water voles than they are in their cousins, the, the short tail field vole and the bank vole, so, uh, which obviously helps them with swimming. Um, a unique feature for water voles and actually for beavers is that they have these um, two orange front facing incisors at the top and two at the bottom which stick out and they use them for digging um, through, head, through hard soil but also for peeling bark off trees and they are bright orange um, because the dentine and the enamel which they have on those teeth is actually covered in ferrous oxide which gives them that orange look. And I can attest to having been bitten by a water vole and it goes right through to the bone due to these very sharp teeth. So it works. So I've got a bit of film footage, which I'm hoping will run through PowerPoint. So this is a water vole at the top and, and a rat at the bottom that I've caught on a camera trap. You can see from the film that actually it's the same site. Um, oh, I'm just going to I keep muting the um, sound recording because otherwise it, you get the sound of the traffic. Um, so I put up a camera trap at these sites just to determine whether there were water voles there. Um, I baited with apple and you can just see the difference between a water vole and a rat. You know, the rat's got that pointy nose, the bigger ears and the pale tail. The water vole is much fluffier um, and has a, a blunt nose and uh, a sort of round face. And in this bit of footage, it's having a really good scratch because they are a host to a number of parasites, just like many other mammals. And then I've got this other bit of film footage, which shows classic water vole um, habitat, really, which is that they like to live in the area at the base of the bank, between the bank and the water, which offers a really nice area that's, that's covered in vegetation, which is a nice runway underneath the vegetation, often offering them protection. Um, and then they slip into the water and they swim away. They, they bob in the water, they do a sort of doggy paddle um, and they sort of float and motor across the water surface. If it's a rat that goes in the water and swims, it tends to whip its tail behind it. So they have quite distinctively different ways of, of traveling through the water. Um, so their ecology. So water voles are big breeders like many of the other um, rodents. They start breeding in the spring. And I mean, in this area where I am, south of Chichester, sometimes that can be in February, depending if the weather is quite mild. Um, they can then be caught out if it's suddenly we have a cold snap, but it's sometime in the spring when, when the temperatures are warm enough that the, the growth of some of the plant species that they use um, in this area, quite often in February, things like hemlock water dropwort are starting to push through um, and they use this as a source of nutrition earlier on in the year. They will have, the females will have between five and six litters during, during the spring and summer of sort of five and six babies. Um, and, you know, a breeding female at the start of the year will be frantically eating to improve her condition. So when she starts breeding, it is nonstop. And normally, once she's given birth, she then releases a hormone and a male water vole will be hanging around in her burrows and he will mate with her within an hour. So when she's lactating for her young, she will also be gestating the next litter group of, you know, to be born. So it is relentless for the females. So by the end of the summer, they are normally in an extremely poor condition. Um, they will have sores on their fur, they'll have parasites, they're normally very thin um, and seldom make it through to a second winter. Um, they have a very um, interesting survival strategy which isn't fully understood yet and there's research being carried out on it but it seems that um, at the time of conception they can influence, the females can influence the sex of their offspring and they think that this is through um, a stress hormone that they release um, at the time um, because the males um, when they've uh, left the, um, the burrow they will tend to move away from the females territory quite quickly and into the wider area and look for other females to, to breed with whereas the females will stay um, fairly close to the mother's territory 
um, and so don't move very far. So if a female is feeling stressed because there isn't enough food, there's a high predation risk, the habitat is particularly poor or whatever, she releases this stress hormone, which means that those males will, will move out of, of the um, immediate area. So it's quite, it's quite an interesting um, influence that they have. Um, the early litter females, if they're born um, early in the year, they can sometimes breed that first year if their weight gets up to sort of above about 25 grams. So, um, but they seldom, um, any water vole will seldom last a year and they normally only last one winter. Um, and, and their life expectancy is pretty short. I mean, in captivity, it can be about two and a half years. So, um, and water voles, the females particularly, are very territorial and they will fight to the death. Um, you know, you can see water voles when you trap them. Um, they can be in a terrible state, the females, with bite marks, infections, ears missing, um, eyes hanging off, tails missing even. So they will absolutely fight to the death. Um, and they mark their boundaries with latrines, um, which they pile up. They have tic tac sized. Um, poo which is made, made up of vegetation so it's not unpleasant at all um, and they pile this up at the end of each of their territories and at key places within their territories quite often on bits of litter and something high up and they pad it down and they reinforce these by rubbing their feet along scent markers along their coat which is like a honeycomb gland which releases a scented oil um, and they rub this on their feet and then they press these down on the latrines and, and all the way through they're running um, up and down um, through their territory just to tell other water voles that actually this space is occupied. And the size of their territory like many mammals will completely depend on the quality of the habitat so in, in linear um, environments where they're in ditches and, and rivers, um, the habitat will, you know, can be sort of 500 metres or it can be a couple of kilometres, depending how deep that habitat is and how wide, again, depending on the quality of the food and the substrate that they're, they're burying into. It may also depend a great deal on the sheer volume of waterfalls in the area um, and and how often they're having to fight to defend their territory. Um, if it's a river um, and it's over five metres wide, sometimes there will be territories on either side of that river. So the different banks will hold different water bowl territories. The males tend to be a bit more fast and loose. They may have a loose territory that holds uh, a number of females within it, but quite often they will just be mating and moving on and mating and dispersing. It's the females that tend to hold those territories. So water voles are herbivorous in the main. There is some evidence that females will eat um, aquatic snails and invertebrates when they're pregnant or lactating. And they think that's because actually their need for protein can become really high with trying to feed an enormous number of young um, and also to gestate um, and bring on um, young in the womb. They need some form of protein sometimes. So they'll be a bit more omnivorous. Um, they don't hibernate. Um, they do spend a bit more time in the burrow system, but they don't hibernate. So they need good quality and diverse vegetation sources all year round. And this can be a real issue in what is increasingly denuded wetland habitat that we now offer, to be honest, in the UK. Um, they need to have a succession of vegetation which is coming through from early spring and growing right through to different vegetation that is con that is that is growing at different heights, offering them different nutrients and different opportunities all the way through into into sort of late autumn, um, and and that can be a real issue. Um, so water vol numbers can really decline. Um, they reckon there's about an eighty percent loss due to starvation, increased predation, and hypothermia. And one of the reasons for that is that, you know, quite often people are out there cutting back and clearing river banks, ditch banks, pond banks. Um, and so they remove much of the vegetation um, and it also removes the cover and they're very, very susceptible to being predated. And then they also suffer from hypothermia. Um, and water voles tend to be less territorial in the winter and, and family groups, siblings, a mother and her young and her last litter may well all bunk up together um, in a burrow system just to try and get through the winter. They'll cache 
some food in the autumn and drag it into one of the burrows that they have, which is below the water line to try and keep it fresh and moist for as long as they can. Um, and they'll use that vegetation just to avoid trying to go out where they're vulnerable on, on the banks of rivers, ditches and ponds. So they live literally in that very small margin on the river banks between the top flatter areas of river, rivers, ditches and, and waterways and, and down to the water's edge. And they prefer steep banks of sort of 45 degrees or more. Um, soft soil, if possible, they can't cope with pure sand. They can't cope with heavily, uh, heavy, heavy clay, which it, which becomes very solid or or um, earth, which is, is particularly stony. Um, and they create a really complex system of burrows and chambers um, which can be up to six meters deep and at different heights they'll have underwater accesses to this burrow system also above ground access um, accesses some quite close to the water like like the one that you you can see here with the water all bobbing out but they'll have some possibly six meters back quite often um, right in the middle of a bramble bush because that will be really safe for them to pop out of and look around and feed so they're always looking for for lots of cover because they're very aware of predators from above um, they prefer um, soft earth and they'll use their pointed um, teeth that, that sort of stick outwards to literally bite into the soil and remove it um, to make to make the tunnels so habitat so if you read the water bowl conservation handbook it describes sort of this idyllic scene of slow moving clean permanent water where the, the height of the water doesn't really vary and it's consistent um, it will be about three meters wide be about a meter deep and it will have um, lovely vegetated banks that go back for sort of 10 meters well in reality water voles are a bit more adaptable than that and where, where I live on the Mount of Peninsula just south of Chichester they actually cope in, in pretty shoddy looking um, habitat um, and that's on the banks of ditches in reed beds which is much, a bit more three-dimensional and streams, canals, marshes, ponds and rivers but also they've been found in brackish pools um, at the back of salt marshes and as long as they can get access to fresh water they can be quite adaptable. Um, and more unusually, they have also been found in arable fields and in Europe, they are considered in some countries to be a pest because they inhabit arable fields and can become uh, feed quite heavily on crops. And they're more fossorial, so they're more land based. Um, and there's actually quite a well known population of fossorial uh, water voles up in Glasgow, um, where they're all black. Um, and they live on a housing estate, a big area which is um, full of, of quite um, vigorous grass and what you'd consider weeds and there's a population that live in there not near any water at all so somehow they have colonized that site and they've completely honeycombed it with lots and lots of burrow systems and they seem to be enduring there so they are the focus of much study so although we think we know the habitat they like they are actually more adaptable than you think so feeding wise, I've said that they're herbivorous and they mainly eat plants and somebody has fed them 227 different species because that number comes up all the time in all the textbooks. So um, and they will eat things like hemlock water dropwort, which are pretty toxic to any other species and which I the only other thing I know that eats it is a, is a goat. Um, uh, I don't think deer touch it. So for water voles, they cope with it in, in about February, March. The only thing I know that water voles don't particularly like, I think, from the evidence that I've seen, surprisingly, is water mint. Um, I've seen ditches full of water mint and other species, and there's evidence they've eaten all the other species and they've not touched the water mint. And I find that time and time again. So I don't know what it is about water mint, but they're not keen. Um, they're very good climbers, and particularly in the spring when they're coming out of the burrows just a bit more and looking to get into breeding condition. They'll climb trees for buds. They'll clamp in the autumn, they'll clamber up into fruit trees, grab apples, um, and, and they love bramble, um, brambles and um, uh, blackberries. Um, 
and I use apples for baiting traps and camera traps because they really do have a sweet tooth. In the winter, they have to adapt their diet and they will um, peel the, the bark off trees and they'll go for roots and rhizomes of things like yellow flag iris. I've also seen them strip the lower leaves of holly leaves, of holly trees, um, and, and to eat the holly um, leaves, which I mean, I can only think that they must be desperate because I don't actually view holly leaves as being particularly attractive, but it just shows that they will try anything. Um, they feed quite often sitting back on their haunches and they will cut the vegetation into lengths, quite long lengths of about 10 centimetres with a 45 degree angle cut. And this is one of their clues of their existence um, on sites. And they create these piles of vegetation um, and they will use these as caches. They will come back and feed from these feeding stations time and time again until eventually the, the, the food there gets a couple of days old. And then they'll, they quite often use these sites as latrines and they will then um, form these piles of poo on them just to tell other water voles to keep away um, and that that territory is occupied. So what is their role in the ecosystem? Um, I can't count the number of times that people have said to me, so what is the point of a water vole and why should we care and why are they important? I have to take a deep breath and explain to people that water voles are really a key. First of all, I mean, they're really key as a food for predators, um, but also they do play an important function. Um, in the 50s and 60s, when we had huge numbers and high densities of water voles in our, in our wetland areas, they actually provided the function of keeping areas open of vegetation. There were that many of them. So they did, they did keep, um, open water, they kept small channels clear of vegetation. Um, and also this encouraged biodiversity, this encouraged other plants to have access to light. So there wasn't domination of a single plant species. They also spread seeds um, through their feces. And in the winter, when they're feeding on the rhizomes of some of the wetland plants, they break them up, bits flow downstream, <clears throat> excuse me, and they allowed colonization. Um, of those plant species elsewhere. So they do have a really important role. But as I mentioned, <coughs> sorry, I'm going to take a sip of water, they are um, a food for many predators. Because they're quite a good size, about the size of a guinea pig, you know, having to eat lots of, um, of mice or one of their cousins, the bank vole or the field vole, you need a lot of those compared to just managing to pick off a nice, a nice fat, juicy water vole. So everything likes to eat water voles pretty much. I mean, you know, owls and raptors, herons um, have a beady eye open for a water vole. I wish personally that they would focus a bit more on the rats, but they're very partial to a water vole. Um, pike, they get attacked by pike um, and stoats and, and otters and, you know, unfortunately domestic cats. Again, the, the number of people that have told me quite proudly that their cats have brought in a water vole, um, you know, and and, uh, and either let it go in the house or, or eaten it. So unfortunately they do get it from every side. Um, but water voles have actually got a way of avoiding these animals. They've adapted um, to surviving and evolved with most of these creatures, whereby if they feel threatened, they will actually jump into the water quite willingly they will stir up the bottom silt to create a kind of water fog and then they'll disappear into an under, underwater burrow um, entrance which they've created and then they'll hide in their system of, of network of, of channels and tunnels and chambers um, and they'll hide out until they think the, the threat is over. Unfortunately their biggest predator, the American mink, they have not evolved with and unfortunately, the, the American mink is very comfortable following the water vole into the water um, and is small enough to wriggle its way into the water vole burrow system and to basically hunt it out. And it will eat um, and kill every water vole that it finds in that system, caching any that it doesn't eat straight away for uh, feeding on later or taking back to its young. And a nursing female mink can clear um, a kilometre stretch of quite densely populated riverbank of all of the water voles in a week. 
So they are extremely efficient hunters and will clear areas very quickly of water voles. So they are an extreme threat. <clears throat> so how do you know if there are water voles um, in, in an area that you're, you're checking or you're surveying for? Well, you have to look for the evidence because the chances of seeing a water vole are slim. There are areas where you get water voles that are quite habituated, um, but generally they're quite shy and, and reluctant to be seen. So under, understanding their behaviour um, and ecology does help with successful surveying um, and it does fall under non-intrusive surveying. So you're not going to get into trouble with the Wildlife and Countryside Act um, and they do leave quite unique signs of their presence. So the first thing that you'd really look for is a latrine because nothing else latrines in a riparian habitat like a water bowl. So if you find this, then you can punch the air and think, yes, we've got water bowls. This is brilliant. So this just gives you an idea of what latrines look like. This classic tic tac. Sometimes they also they're squashed down because the water bowl is walking up the material up and down in its habit, in its territory. But also they love a bit of litter. So I've got a picture here, which was a drum, which was the side of a of a the big plastic um, agricultural drum um, in a ditch and, and that was perfect for a water vole to latrine on but I've seen them latrine on surfboards, on crisp packets, they, I've even found one on a leather football which was floating in a ditch and the water vole had continually climbed on top of this thing and latrine on top of it. I mean, it would have been brilliant to have got a picture of, of that. But yes, yeah, so they, they, anywhere that's prominent that will show off their presence, that's where they will tend to latrine. They also have the feeding stations that I've mentioned, and this is not small pieces of, of grass, which could be confused with bank voles or short-tail field voles. This is big pieces of reed. This is whole, whole plants of, of um, yellow flag iris, really quite big chunky pieces. And once they've finished using them as a feeding station, they'll latrine on them quite often. So putting the two together, the feeding stations and the latrines, that tells you that there's probably, there are water voles and also they're very likely to be in breeding condition because these are the classic signs. But then you'll also get a honeycombing effect of burrows into the side of banks, quite often with, with runs, a wet area along the front where they're using that area underneath vegetation, um, which is offering them some nice cover from, from above, for things like herons. Um, and you can see in the, in, in the burrow entrance here, you've actually got a latrine as well there. So that looks like it's being used currently. It's got a nice wet area there. So water voles are actively using this. And then the other things that you have are the cut, cut ends, like I mentioned, the nice 45 degree angle. You sometimes get a stoppered burrow, which is when a water vole, um, especially during the winter, will close up some of the holes into its burrow and it forms a plug out of vegetation, mud and um, feces. And it forms this stopper, which it, pulls in to its burrow um, and we're not sure why it does that it may be to try and keep water levels um, consistent and, and out of the burrow system maybe to increase air temperature but I'm not sure but we've, I've only ever actually seen that once although I've read quite a lot about it um, strip bark um, I saw the water vole stripping this uh, willow um, during the winter desperate for food the classic plop sound um, as you walk, walk along a waterway. Sometimes they'll also create above ground nests. They're like giant harvest mice nests up in, in reeds or in dense, dense vegetation. And I mean, I've seen that in two sites. Once was at the Medmary um, realignment scheme um, that was put in by the EA, where somebody had created, uh, well, the EA created six kilometers of, of beautifully um, specialised habitat for water voles and the driver had especially gone on and patted down the earth which unfortunately was solid clay creating a concrete like substrate which the water voles that were reintroduced to that site were unable to penetrate for about three years resulting in the reintroduced water voles fleeing into the nearby ditch systems and into the agricultural area and those that remained having to produce these above ground harvest type nests to live in um, so it wasn't ideal it took about three years for all the vegetation to be able to penetrate 
that earth and, and for the ground to break up enough for water voles to use that habitat, which was a bit of a shame. The other place where I've seen it is on the Chishta Canal, where between the towpath and the water, the area where the water voles are living, the riparian strip is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And there's increased competition for burrow space by the water voles. And so some of them have gone upwards like high rise block of flats really, um, and have created these nests. Not convinced how successful they are because obviously they are accessible to stoats and mink and, and other uh, predators. And the other thing that you could look for are footprints um, in the muddy substrate next to the burrows and along the, the waterways and the runs. But it is quite difficult to differentiate a waterfall footprint from a rat footprint, but they have a very star shaped footprint. Um, but I think you'd have to be quite an expert to, to differentiate them. But, you know, putting this all together would tell you whether that you have water voles in that waterway or not. So why are water voles special? Well, they are a really good flagship species um, for wetlands, really. You know, a lot of people view ditches and wetland areas as unattractive spaces, when in fact they should be biodiversity hotspots. And, you know, um, water voles are a brilliant flagship species because they need good, pretty much need a good quality habitat with lots of riparian wetland species, uh, plants, good quality um, water, um, which, you know, will then give you a healthy ecosystem in which lots of other riparian species, invertebrates, birds, etc., will survive. But they're cute, they look cuddly, and the public love a cute, cuddly animals, so therefore they become a flagship species. Trying to sell a frog, trying to sell a water beetle or, or, a, or a, an aquatic shrimp is just not, doesn't just quite hit that nail on the head, so we go for something cute. But, you know, despite the fact that they're gorgeous, they are in national decline. Um, so surveys across the UK by the Vincent Trust in 1989 to 1998 showed that in 75% um, of sites that have previously had water voles where water vole surveys have been carried out and they have been found 75% of those sites they were now absent so this was a huge um, survey that went on and it was a real blow and it showed that there was a real problem nationally with water vole numbers so the government took notice after a bit of time and a national biodiversity action plan was written and this was rolled out across the country with much pomp and ceremony as these things are. Um, a number of 1.2 million water voles approximately was mentioned, which to a lot of people sounds like a lot, but, but for um, you know, a small rodent mammal, that is actually not a good number, especially nationally, especially one that has an 80% mortality rate in the winter and has a huge number of predators. Um, the EA was made the lead conservation body, um, you know, which meant to coordinating all these, you know, fantastic potential opportunities to conserve this, this lovely mammal. Um, so regional biodiversity action plans were written, um, county biodiversity action plans were written. It was, it was rolled out to be cascaded down to local authorities. It was to be looked at by planning authorities and taken into consideration. So 2010, the population numbers were estimated to now be 400,000 nationally. So the news was not looking good. And then in the EEA, the EEA announced in 2013 that in the previous two years, there'd probably been another 20% decline. And in 2015, the EEA said, actually, we think there's probably been another 250% decline. So we are looking at water vol numbers in free fall. And, um, you know, I will point out, um, like with many species, it is very difficult to tell you definitively what the population of waterfalls are. It's very difficult to count them. I'm asked all the time, oh, how do you think they're doing? How many are in this area? And you try to explain to people that, you know, you can't actually catch them all and count them. Um, they're very elusive. You know, they there have been studies done where um, 
you know, equations have been used and theories have been used and, you know, we can guesstimate approximately how many waterfalls there are. You, know, you look at densities of populations, you look at suitable habitat and then you extrapolate. Well, therefore, hopefully there's this many waterfalls, but there's a huge margin of error. Um, and it's never as simple as that, as every piece of habitat can be quite can be quite different. So um, this is guesstimating, but ultimately um, everybody will tell you that they are in decline. Um, and if you speak to you know, experts like uh, Derek Gow and Tom Morehouse, who you know, um, have detailed knowledge of all of the research projects going on across the UK, they will tell you that they are in decline. So you know, let's love them, let's look after them, and let's hope they're still around in 10 years time. So where do waterfalls sit with the law? Well, one of the things that came out of government action um, it was in 2008 that they did gain full legal protection. Previous to that, they had been covered, um, but only um, their habitat, ironically, had been protected for intentional destruction. But with the 2008 um, uh, change to the Wildlife and Countryside Act, it then made it illegal to actually kill injure or take wild water voles from the wild directly. And also it, it took away ignorance of defence. You now could be prosecuted if um, you recklessly damaged habitat or destroyed it or obstructed water vole from gaining um, access to its habitat or disturbed that habitat with you know a fine or six months in prison. So you know the law is there in place and ignorance is no longer a defence. But you know let's face it, who cares? Who actually cares? Um, there is absolutely no enforcement of the law that I can see. I um, have reported many incidents of uh, habitat destruction um, across my area. I've reported to the Police Environment Agency in Natural England and nothing has happened. Nobody is interested, absolutely nobody. So um, I am sure that, and I'm aware that that is happening nationally. So we can have all the policies that we like, we can talk the big talk, you know, at government level, but if nothing's actually happening on the ground where it's happening, where destruction is happening, then we're not going to win the fight. We really are not. So why are waterfall numbers declining? Well, like every uh, decline of species, of course, there are many factors um, involved, but of course, the biggest one is going to be habitat loss. So these are photos that I've taken um, just in my area. Um, and it becomes, you know, it's about fragmentation of habitat. It's about um, affecting genetic dispersal. Um, so three of these photos have um, just are good examples of where the habitat has basically just been completely removed leaving water voles without any food, completely and utterly exposed to predators and completely vulnerable that when they stick their head out of a burrow, they will, um, they'll be eaten. Um, or where in the case of the cows, the cattle going into the water, that's just very poor farm practice. There are water voles there and the, um, the cattle are being allowed to poach the banks and um, they will crush the, the water vole burrows. Um, and have an effect on their habitat, if not kill the waterfalls directly. So, um, and um, in this, in in these two cases, the the burrows were also destroyed by diggers. So, um, and here, just all the vegetation was removed. These were reported, and and nothing happened. And I tried to remonstrate with the landowners and land managers at the time, and was basically told to clear off. So, um, so this is happening all the time everywhere. You also then got. Um, our friend the the mink and the American mink and you know unless there is a national strategy of removing American mink and it has to be done on a national scale then we're not going to win the fight of water vol, um, conservation you know there have been a lot of highly publicized reintroduction campaigns to put water voles back into sites some are um, successful and some aren't, you know, some we have to look beyond five and ten years at the long term persistence of water voles. But unless you remove mink first, they will not persist. And unless you have an ongoing program of removing mink, they will not persist. Um, 
in East Anglia, there are three counties that are working together to remove mink from those counties. And they're, you know, they've got a really good strategy, but it has to be a long term and funded strategy. And that's the thing, you know, you can get money initially sometimes to, to set up the traps and um, and the rafts and, and get things going. But but continuing these things really long term with the equipment and the the volunteers, um, and the coordination that's needed you know that that's the hard sell is to keep these things going long term so that that has a direct impact on on water bowl success so um so we've got that direct predation with the american mink but then so we also have through non-native invasive species we have just sheer habitat degradation um water bowls will not persist in an area like this with with himalayan balsam there is nothing for water bowls to eat here after they've had a bit of a nibble on Himalayan balsam, they'll need other plants to feed on. They are grazers that eat an enormous range of plants and Himalayan balsam has an incredibly short growing, flowering and dying season, which then leaves the banks with nothing else to offer, bare banks which are susceptible to flooding in the winter. Um, so this these these waterways will not have water voles in them. This is monkey flower, which is starting to invade a site here. Um, and this is floating pennywort, which the covering of that is so thick and dense, water voles will be unable to penetrate underneath there um, and get to their burrows for protection. And I've seen foxes and stoats actually just walk across areas like this. So the water itself is not offering them any barriers to access um, both sides of the bank and therefore to be able to predate water voles. And it also ultimately will again compete out um, other um, aquatic plant and riparian plant species so um, it really you know removing non-native species is a really key thing to prevent biodiversity loss and then of course you've got the effect of pollution whether that be through agriculture or more like direct pollution with oils and things but that reduces breeding success because it affects uh, waterfowl health you've got the knock-on effect of diseases they they do have external parasites and they're more likely to succumb to external and internal parasites um, if they are if they are affected by disease you've got accidental poisoning um, because many people mix them up think they've seen a rat and it might be a water vole and they put rat control measures down near waterways which um, which threatens uh, water voles if the colonies that make up populations um, get cut off from the wider larger population these little colonies that um, that, are, that are so key for creating a diverse um, genetic stock and then and then have water bowls um, traveling between them if they get cut off from the wider population then that continuous genetic exchange is affected and, and they start to be affected by uh, by inbreeding coefficients and eventually they don't persist in sites um, general hu human development, you know, and spreading of, um, of humans across wild areas, you know, accidental destruction, population fragmentation, cats, dogs, litter, everything that goes with humans, unfortunately, um, affects the wider environment, affects waterways and then affects water voles lack of legal enforcement, which I've already had my own personal rant about. Um, and then, of course, we've got, you know, climate change where things are, are wetter. Um, wet winters causing flooding which can drown water voles in their burrows but actually in the area where I am drier for longer so a lot of the ditches that they live in end up completely drying out and water voles are incredibly loyal to their burrow system but there is a point at which they will have to leave and find water so um, that becomes an issue and basically the amount of habitat available to them um, decreases so why do they persist on the Manor Peninsula which is where I live well, it is quite interesting, but it's because we have a lot of linked habitat here and not all of it is great. I mean, the drainage ditch here in this picture is actually only about 50 centimetres wide. It does dry out in the height of summer if we've had a dry summer. But adjacent to this drainage ditch is a field which is full of horses, which has big water troughs in it. And water voles can be seen sat underneath the water troughs, eating a lush vegetation there. Um, and, and in the hedgerows um, and so they've sort of adapted um, but 
the drainage ditches are attached to the rifes. The rifes do stay wet year round um, as they go out to sea. We have hundreds of farm ponds across the peninsula and village. we have village ponds connected again to the ditch system. We've got the Chichester Canal, which bisects across the Manor Peninsula, reed beds at Pagham, Chichester and Medmarie. And we also have the Medmarie Specialist Habitat. And all of these linked habitats mean that, you know, we do have this very mobile population of water voles, which moves about in response to environmental change um, and, and they can find habitat. Um, and it's whether they, and I think the key to their survival is ensuring that those links exist so they can respond. Where they tend to die out is where the colonies can no longer access other colonies and can no longer move around. So that seems to be why they, they persist here. And also my group, my small um, wildlife charity that I work for, have been very active in monitoring and, and trying to get in and remove non-native species, um, which, which affect this, this very important wetland habitat. We've also been involved in ongoing research. We've been trapping water voles um, and uh, tagging them and then looking at their dispersal routes and their territory sizes. We've been doing DNA analysis using hair tubing again, looking to see how they're related across different sites and then trying to work, and therefore working out which routes they're using and therefore which areas need to be improved or protected more. So really trying to get involved. And this is where my next project called the Flow Project came about, which was looking at landscape scale wetland improvement, really for waterfalls and looking at how um, we can make improvements to ensure that the population we have persists here. But it also kind of became a bit of a human beaver project. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, so the Manor Peninsula, there's a map here now, which is this is Chichester and this is the Manor Peninsula. Um, it's surrounded on three sides by the sea, which presents its own challenges when you're trying to get rid of lots of surface water. Um, it's very flat and it is the floodplain for the South Downs. So we get a lot of water coming through groundwater. We also get a lot of surface water and the area is covered in a network of drainage ditches, which were hist historically dug in um, a couple of hundred years ago and which are now um, in pretty poor condition, disconnected, missing in many parts. But this is A1 agricultural land we're talking about. So it is, you know, farmed on an industrial scale, really, and very intensely. Um, and we also have quite big areas of glass houses, which are old on four acre plots, which um, when they were built in the 70s and 80s, there was no requirement at all to have reservoirs to hold the water and it's piped directly into the ditches. So this contributes significantly to flooding during the winter when we have high rainfall, which inundates. So 2012, 2013, we had a huge amount of flooding and then subsequent years during the winter. And it really did show that the, the network of, of ditches and ponds and things were not functioning. Many of them were not connected to one another and a great deal of number of properties and roads flooded. So out of this came this wetland recovery project. The idea was the, to look at sort of natural flood management, um, basically improving and extending waterfall habitat while reducing flood risk. And depending who I was talking to and trying to sell it to, if I was talking to West Sussex County Council Highways team, I would talk about flood risk reduction. And if I was talking to the wildlife trusts or, or people who are more interested in biodiversity um, and the environment, then I would talk about waterfall habitat creation. So it was a really good project to, to, to focus um, different aspects of it to different people. So we started off by surveying, using volunteers, a brilliant team of volunteers, um, to survey across the peninsula, the 11 parishes that make up the peninsula. Um, and it was a huge undertaking and we surveyed 1800 ditches, 350 kilometers plus, um, which, which added to a lot of volunteer days. Um, they all ate lots of cake to keep them going because walking ditches um, in horrible weather, be it very hot or very, very wet and windy and cold, can be quite mind numbing and gruelling. Um, but a huge amount of data was collected, which was invaluable. 
So this just shows you some of the main ditches in some of the parishes. Um, we were able to collect physical data. So we were looking at the lengths of the ditches. We were looking at the depth of the ditches. We were sort of taking those physical characteristics. Then we were looking at biological data. So we were looking at what made up the plant communities. We were looking at biological diversity, whether they were, we thought, you know, there were water voles there, were there size of water voles, um, any other species. And then we took lots of environmental data. So we were looking at what the substrate of the soil was like, the depth of the water, the silt depth, um, the depth of the buffer zone, um, you know, all sorts of, of data was gathered just while we were there. Let's get as much information as we can. And we also did hedgerow surveys where there was a hedge associated with the ditch. Then we also surveyed the hedgerow because it's a double whammy. If you've got a hedge next to a ditch, then you've got a really good wildlife corridor for numerous, numerous species. So it was good to know where they were and where in future they could be improved. So having gathered this qualitative data, we then had to turn it into quantitative data so that we could give it a score, we could do some comparisons and the data could kind of could be used and mapped. And then we, um, yeah, we, 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 we gave them condition scores and, and we put it on maps. And we came up with this traffic light scheme because it just seemed much more visual. So this just gives you an idea of, of one of the parishes. So where it's red, it means it's a pretty poor ditch. Where you've got amber colours, it means that actually the ditches are in moderate condition. And if they're green, then they're good. Um, it's fairly basic, um, but we can drill down and have a look at that information in more detail. And out of that, we came up with um, a report for each of the parishes which showed the condition assessments for each of the parish and where we'd come up with sites that could be improved, how they could improve. We curated a cost of management plan on how much it would cost, what would be needed etc for those parishes to take forward or the landowners and out of those many many sites we actually worked on 51 of those sites with the landowners to, to improve them. Um, and we gave all the data that we collected to district councils, county councils, the environment agency, etc. So we gave them our layers so they could load them up into their systems because we don't, we you know, there's no point in us just holding this data. It's really important that this data is help everybody. We found that, you know, the information that was held is so disjointed. You know, highways will hold their bit. The district council, the planning authority will hold their bit. Environment agency have their bit. But there's no definitive overall understanding of how the wetland system works. Flow direction of water, capacity of ditches, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we you know, we collected that data. And yeah, they said 75% of this is new. So it's been really important. So these are just a quick a pin drop on of our improvement sites. It was difficult to know how to focus. There were so many sites, so we had to prioritise. So we prioritised those sites where flooding had been an issue in the past, where the 1846 tithe map showed that there had previously been ponds or ditches that had either been filled in or were just relic and overgrown or had been completely disconnected from the system. We chose areas that stayed wet for, for longer um, were linked to areas that had water bowl uh, records nearby and which could be improved as a community asset in some cases. We also had to prioritise sites where obviously the landowners were engaged, would get involved and where the long term maintenance of these sites would, would be assured. And, you know, we were successful within two years. 25% of these sites which hadn't had water voles in previously um, had water voles in them. And sometimes they moved in, to be honest, before we wanted them to, because we hadn't finished our work and now we were at risk of um, uh, affected, being affected by the Wildlife and Countryside Act um, and affecting their habitat. So we had to be a bit careful, but it was good news, absolutely good news. And I, you know, I believe that five years on, all of those sites will have water voles in, um, hopefully. So what we were doing when we were doing our improvement work was we were really trying to, in many ways, um, recreate the work that beavers carry out because beavers adapt the, their surrounding environment for their own purposes and for their own uses. And the key thing that they do is they hold water back um, um, in catchment areas. Um, and that's what we were trying to do. We we're trying to hold water off roads and properties in important areas and use the natural environment to do that. And beavers do this as part of a defence strategy to protect themselves because their happy place is in water 
Um, they view this as a safe place from predators um, and will surround themselves and create, you know, island lodges um, to keep themselves safe um, from, I mean, in this country, they don't have predators like they do on, on the continent, which would be bears and wolves. But they're hardwired into thinking that's who they need to protect themselves from. And they also have a strategy to create food larders. So they'll cache um, food, uh, trees, um, lots of vegetation. They'll cache this in their lodges underneath the water and in dams um, and in special food cache areas. Um, and, and they want access to that year round. And they do this by cutting down trees and creating dammed areas and then filling that with vegetation. But they also move huge amounts of spoil around and silt and they pack this into the base of the dams and not only does it deepen the water where they've removed this from um, but it also packs it into the dams to form a more impenetrable um, place that holds the water back um, and they will they you know they do this physically by scooping up um, the spoil and, and pushing it in so this helps to trap pollutants um, and improves water quality and it holds back nitrates, phosphates um, and other PPP products that come off the land and it holds it in silt in those beavers, beaver pools. Um, it's quite incredible and, and while they do it, it's creating amazing microclimates and, and, and habitats and little pools and sheltered spots and and lovely curved um, curves and and you know it's not neat and it's just perfect for lots and lots of other species and that results in an absolute biodiversity surge. The trees and the vegetation that's been pushed underneath the water starts to break down. You get different microbes working away on this, which become a source of food for invertebrates. The invertebrates become food for fish, amphibians. When they emerge, this becomes food for, for birds and bats. And water voles just love the, the more open spaces, the, the lack of shading that, that beavers create along the water's edges, which allow riparian plants to grow up. And that's where you've got your water voles enjoying this wide range of, of riparian plants. So water voles and beavers very much inhabit the same space um, and are very happy bedfellows. Um, but yes, the resultant biodiversity is incredible. And this just gives, it's a pictorial display of that. Just shows the variety of habitats that beavers create by raising groundwater, by killing trees um, that don't like to have their feet wet, creating dead, lovely dead standing wood, providing lots of different um, conditions for wetland plants um, and the spread of seeds. Um, and so many other species benefit. So. So we'll now talk a little bit about castor fibre. Um, it's the second um, largest uh, rodent. Um, the capybara is the biggest rodent, um, but beavers are the second largest one, but it is actually this one, the European beaver is a bit smaller than its North American cousin, but it's still pretty big at 20 plus kilos at about one meter long. Um, I actually got um, a female European beaver, a taxidermied one, She's called Betty. She came from Bavaria and she um, is actually related to some of the beavers that have been brought over from Europe to reintroduce into the UK. And she is big. I mean, people are surprised at just how big they are. And the females can be just a little bit bigger than the males, but it isn't always obvious. So they are semi-aquatic. They are incredibly well and fully adapted to life um, in the water. They have very powerful, fully webbed um, back feet. They have a very distinctive big tail, which is very, which is fat. It's fairly flat. It's quite shiny. It has a few hairs on it. Um, it is a place where they store fat and can be a, for their, a sign of health. Um, they have ears, um, eyes and nose that are all along the top of their head so they can sit in the water um, and, and see what's going on, hear what's going on, um, but most of them is immersed. Um, and they are completely adaptive with constricting nostrils, ear flaps and lips that fold behind their mouths and tongues that form a prevention of any water entering any of their orifices basically um, under pressure. They are completely adapted. 
and they had the densest fur of any of any mammal, 23,000 um, hairs per centimetre squared. And they have a really specially adapted back claw on the second on the second toe um, on the outside of their foot in, and it's a split claw. It's on both of their back feet, and they use this. It's like a comb for grooming their fur because they spend much time grooming their fur um, and making sure it's in good shape because they are completely reliant on this to keep them warm and the water doesn't penetrate the, the thick fur and, and get to their skin so it keeps them completely dry but they have to look after it they take out you know any vegetation they comb out parasites and they spend a lot of time grooming one another they mainly swim on the surface, but they can go down for five or six minutes. Um, the maximum is probably about 15 minutes, but it can be very deceptive because what they'll do is they'll go down and they'll swim really fast under the water to get away from a perceived predator or, or a problem. And they'll bob up, um, you know, right next to a lodge or or go into a, um, an underground burrow. And so people think that they've been down a lot longer than they have actually been down. Um, they're pretty nocturnal um, and they will be active sort of at dawn and dusk, but they're seldom seen during the day and they go through sort of four hourly cycles of activity. So they won't necessarily be active all the way through the night. They'll go and they'll go and have a nap and rest up in the lodge and then they'll come come back out again. Um, but that's when they do most of their um, sort of going and foraging for food and, and starting to, to work on downing trees and things. So this just gives you an idea of their distribution. So about 400 years ago, um, you know, they were widely seen across Europe. Um, interestingly, though, not, not Ireland, but across Europe. And then during sort of Henry VIII's very heavy hunting days and, and period, and, and after that, um, their numbers were in sharp, sharp decline. I mean, there wasn't really any part of a beaver that wasn't used by people. Their fur you know, it was used for gloves and coats and hats because it was extremely warm. Um, and the, the, the anal glands that they, um, they have produced um, castorum, which was seen as a medic medicinal fluid, um, is a, a, a glandular oil secreted from the base of the tail and was, was seen as, yeah, being really important for all sorts of things and was used in, 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 in many forms. So, Unfortunately, um, these particular attributes meant that they were highly prized and, and overhunted. So in the 1900s, um, you can see that the distribution is patchy at best. So a large scale reintroduction program um, went, went on for about the 1980s because it was realized really that, to be honest, the extinction of the beaver caused more problems than really it, it ever solved um, and cured. You know, without their hydrological engineering um, and with the land drainage practices that were instigated in the Industrial Revolution, you know, our lands had actually become incredibly prone to both flooding and drought. So a big beaver reintroduction program went on across sort of 24 European countries um, from about the 80s. And now, um, you know, the numbers have gone up to about 1.2 million from what they think was probably around 1,200 um, across those four sites. So the, the numbers have increased dramatically. There's interesting if there's a small population of the Canadian, the North American um, beaver here, but it is a distinctly different, pop, you know, um, animal and they don't crossbreed. Actually, um, the North American um, beaver only has 40 chromosomes, whereas the European one has 48. So they, they can't breed successfully. Um, and, uh, and I think rather enthusiastically, the North American beavers were put in here and they're actually now trying to um, trap them out. But I imagine that was going to be quite a difficult job. So yes, we have now started putting beavers into the UK and there's a lot in in Scotland, in Tayside, um, there's there's a large number of beavers there. They think going up from about 141 territories, so that's quite a lot. But they've reintroduced them also now in Wales, in Cornwall, in Devon. There's a population. There's they put some in Sussex recently. There's some in Kent. 
Um, so they're, they're looking more and more at introducing them into the UK, which is brilliant news. So despite what the um, Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe book said, beavers are actually completely herbivorous. They don't eat fish. Um, 300 plus plant species, and I think they'll pretty much eat anything. I've, um, they'll eat Japanese knotweed, they'll eat, you know, all the invasives that you can think of. They're not fussy, they'll eat it. Um, and in the summer, they, they pretty much stick to vascular plants. They're quite happy munching their way through all the nice green things and the reeds and things. Um, and in the winter, they'll focus more on woody vegetation that tend, um, you know, into the autumn and winter, which is slightly different from the, their North American cousins that tend to eat woody vegetation um, through the summer and spring. But that can also be due to the longer periods of snow covered ground um, during the winter um, in, in that environment. So they don't eat wood. They actually eat the, on a tree. They'll eat the leaves, the stem, the roots and the bark, but they don't eat wood pulp. So that's a bit of a misnomer. And they do food cache. So there is no true hibernation. They're eating all the way through the year. Um, and most of the trees that they go for are actually the smaller ones. They don't really want to put the effort into felling huge trees, but they will do so if it falls within the 20 metre, their favourite zone of 20 metres of the waterway. And that's the area they tend to stick to, but they're quite happily chomping away on willow um, saplings and, and keep an older and things that will actually benefit from um, being constantly managed. Um, they live in social groups, um, family groups, and they tend to have a male and female and they'll have a couple of years worth of litters living with them. They're very territorial and they will defend their territories and there's a dominance hierarchy um, within groups within an area, um, but also within um, the social unit. So obviously the, the, the um, breeding male and female, the alphas, and they will suppress any, any you know, breeding from their offspring. Um, but the offspring will stay with them if there are not suitable um, hab habitats or territories for them to move into, they will stay for longer. Um, they are philopatric, which means that they like to stay in the, in the area and very loyal to um, the local area and territory and, and won't move far if they don't have to. They spend a lot of time doing social grooming and vocalising to one another and they have a mutual behaviour of, of, of tail slapping if they perceive any kind of threat to let others know that there is a potential uh, predator. So, as Alison said, they don't have any external sex organs, just a, a, a cloaker, which, um, it, which can make managing beavers in a sort of um, uh, a reintroduction scenario and captivity quite a challenge because you actually have to get to grips with, um, a, a, with a, a beaver and have a look. Um, I know Alison talked about um, uh, x-raying them, but I know now that the people that managing in captivity they do actually have ways of, of examining them but it takes a couple of them to grapple and lift the tail and, and have a good old prod and a poke to work out what's what and you know mistakes have been made and males have been put you know together into a captive situation and and two females have been put in and the wrong sex have been released into um in reintroduction programs because you know unless as Alison said you actually x-ray them um, you know, it, it is really hard to tell what you're looking at. Um, and unfortunately, there isn't always an X-ray available in some of these remote locations. So you are relying on people knowing. Um, and un until the female breeds and she has quite visible, she's lactating and she has quite visible teats, they can really look quite identical. So, um, yeah, that, that can be a management issue. They, I mean, they were met, it, the understanding was that they were, strictly monogamous within a pair but the genetics has actually shown a bit of a different story and it looks like occasionally a female will sneak off and have a have a quick uh, hook up shall we say with a with a nearby male um and uh, so actually the family male can bring up young that, that unwittingly are not his so it does happen but they typically mate in january february and the gestation is just over 100 days they have approximately two to four kits and they tend to have a litter per year, but the kits will stay with them um, for a couple of years. Um, now, 
beaver mortality and what regulates the population. So in the wild, they can live to sort of 12 to 14 years, but like, like many species in, in captivity, it can go up to sort of 25 years. And I think the oldest one is 28 years. Um, you know, in the wild, what affects the most is probably infections after fighting. Um, you know, they're in the water. Um, they can get their skin ripped off um, and, and have some very bad and nasty bites from these huge, great chisels that they have um, of teeth. So they are prone to infections. Um, kits can get predated even in this country. They suspect that otters have taken um, beaver kits and foxes. So they are particularly vulnerable when they're very small. Um, diseases and parasites, there are um, a type of liver fluke that is prevalent in beavers. There's also um, a, interestingly enough, there's a beetle that lives on their on their skin. Um, so, and they, they get ticks, they get mites, fleas, like everything else. And if their condition isn't good, if they're not being able to feed well, um, these parasites can overwhelm them. They also have um, intestinal worms that are very specific to them. So they can, the juveniles can be affected by flooding. They can get caught in their burrows and flooded out. Um, and, you know, occasionally they will have to be culled. Um, they've had to cull the odd one in Scotland when they've become a bit rampant. And, and despite being moved back to better territories or... Um, or being discouraged from deciding to build a dam across an important culvert, they become a problem. Um, and in the winter, they can suffer from hypothermia and poor condition. Um, and traffic, the good old running across the road and getting hit by everything, isn't that the best way of surveying mammals, seeing what's dead on the road? So unfortunately, yeah, they get hit like everything else. Um, and I think actually there was one recently that got, got a reintroduced one that got, got, got hit um, in, in the road. So, um, yes, and then population regulation um, in the wild, probably aggressive interaction between dispersing yeah, beavers um, as, they, as they mature um, and want to find their own territories and, and other territorial families. Um, that keeps numbers down. Dispersing um, juvenile beavers, not being able to find um, other ter territories to occupy and therefore not being able to, to mate um, and, and uh, and start reproducing. So there's a there is a carrying capacity to any area, um, which will then have you know a negative feedback loop, increased stress, then you get lower reproduction and higher mortality. And you know, literally physically bound also by environmental features, you know, suitable habitat, um, you know, mountains, um, road developments, and actual uh, physical physical features um, may well uh, regulate a population. So. And then, you know, they do modify the behaviour, uh, European beavers, you know, through foraging. It changes the tree structure and composition. So they will take out um, the trees adjacent to waterways up to about 20 metres away. And this can have a, a, a big impact, increasing the riparian vegetation, the diversity, other trees getting a chance to, to grow, um, even if they're constantly coppiced um, and creating dead standing wood. Water voles will ring a tree. They may not take it all the way down, especially if it's particularly big, or they may bring it down and just leave it lying there. And this is all great dead standing wood for beetles um, and invertebrates and for bird species. They also dam up areas um, and, and raise the adjacent land, um, water, uh, groundwater in the adjacent land, which can kill trees, um, but also cause ponding and wet areas and marshy areas and fens. Um, they also create actual ponds, which are opportunities for, for, for fish and water voles. And there's that sediment um, retention. Um, it's all about creating different conditions and microclimates and beavers are experts at it. And then they also excavate channels. They, they create these canals to get them from one place to another because they always feel exposed. So they create actual ditches um, to, to, to kind of swim through or they almost kind of belly push their way through these areas um, and they create yeah big large underground water chambers all good for for different species and they increase the complexity of water edges you know there's there's shallow areas there's um uh deep areas there's there's nice flat um sort of ledges um and great places for fish to uh, create nurseries um 
and they also slow the water speed down um, and, and widen uh, wetland areas. So it all has a really positive impact. So some of this um, can be seen, you know, in this pictorial, just gives you an idea of this um, that's going on. And it was this that we were really trying to replicate when we were doing some of the work on flow, um, put meanders into water courses, um, raise, raise water ground levels so that you get the ingress of, of water, more aquatic vegetation. And, you know, when you go to a site that um, a beaver's been on, it, it's like going in, in the winter months, visiting the Somme. I mean, it is just like bombs have gone off and there's piles of silt and there's deep holes. And then in the spring, it just goes mad. Um, there's absolute green covering of lush vegetation and the dragonflies and the damselflies and then the birds. And it's just so, so impressive. It happens really quickly. Um, so... This is what we were trying to do, really. But before we went in and did it, what we were mindful of, which beavers are not, is, well, hang on a minute, what's what's there already and what do we need to be aware of? Is there something that we don't know about just lurking around in this neglected pond or relic ditch? And so we carried out lots of species surveys. And we also got um, records from the Biodiversity Record Centre to make sure they weren't great crested newts or, or some very rare plant that we should know about. And then with this in mind, we then sort of dived in, put on the old wellies and carried out loads of physical work parties with volunteers. Um, volunteers using hand tools are an absolute godsend. I mean, it's such, such a good thing to do. From my point of view, being a project manager, it's great because you can very um, subtly go into a site and remove vegetation piece by piece, expose things because without a doubt, you just don't know what you're going to find until you get in and you can see what's there. And we always had surprises. But, you know, using hand tools, there's a subtlety about it um, and you can do things at your own pace. Um, and, in, and it's incredibly rewarding. We had a huge range of volunteers and it was so good for well-being and being out um, and just seeing so many different things. So we tended to throw um, volunteers into a site with wellies and waders on, get really muddy, have a brilliant time. And then sometimes um, we would then bring in the big guns because Inevitably, if we needed to bring trees down um, to replicate the work of beavers, stack it up like dead wood on a site, bring in big, big specialist diggers to dig out. This is digging out um, a piece of relic canal so that we can really open up the waterways and remove some of the clogging silt. Some of these sites, this hadn't been managed in 150 years. So we're talking about a lot of organic and dead material. Um, we would have uh, bat ecologists on site just to make sure that any trees we took down, you know, we were mind, very mindful of that and had those surveys done. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, these projects varied hugely. Some of them were very small. Um, this was on a road that flooded all the time. And the county council said to me, have you got any ideas for this? Looked on a tithe map. Well, there used to be a pond there. So we put a pond back in put in a culvert under the road and connected it to the ditch system. And we now have a lovely pond. It's now full of riparian vegetation. We planted fruit trees around it. It's got water voles in it and is doing really well. We then did larger projects like the, the um, abandoned relic canal, um, which has just, just bloomed um, with different trees uh, that we planted. Now it isn't shaded. We also did sites, we connected up, we put in a ditch that connected up, a relic ditch that had disappeared, we put that in to connect up a whole system. And we put in paths, and this is now an amazing um, resource for the community, it's a public access. And this was a huge rubbish dump and had been for years, so we cleared that out, dug it out, and it's now um, a brilliant pond. Again, it's got, they've got water bowls in there. And then after we did the work, we were very aware that we left a lot of these sites looking really quite traumatized and damaged. So we planted hedgerows, we put in lots, 25 plus native tree species, um, coir rolls full of different wetland plants that were local to the area, all native, lots of wildflower seeding on those sites, very specific to the soil type and, and the conditions on site, and all to help mop up and improve water quality and just have that that absolute surge of biodiversity um, to really make a difference. 
We also did lots of post survey um, surveying, species surveying, because it was really important that we didn't just go and do this work and then walk away and like fingers crossed this was this, you know, had done what we wanted to do. We needed to know and be able to prove that actually we had benefited the sites. So yeah, we got we, you know, we got surprises, we got badges where they've previously been a rubbish dump. This is a little, this is quite a young water bowl on a on a ditch that that we worked on. Um, and we also did masses of moth trapping, reptile um, surveys, butterfly surveys, bat surveys. Um, and put all of that data into iRecord to go to the Sussex Biodiversity Records Centre because it's so important this biological data is gathered. You know, increasingly as development becomes a threat, we, you know, we must highlight that these areas are really important biodiversity hotspots. Um, and there is wildlife here. The consultants for the develop ecological consultants for developers will tell you quite often, oh, there's nothing important here. But that's, you know, we wanted to prove that, that they were, and these ditches have value. They're not just ditches, they are wetland, um, you know, wildlife corridors. So um, we also produced resources on how to um, sensitively manage ditches and, and waterways, because a lot of people have them at the end of their gardens or through their gardens. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think that this is the ideal. We're trying to explain that this isn't the ideal. This is the ideal. Um, you know, this won't silt up quickly. This has will have much better water quality. Um, and also you might see something interesting, whereas this will silt up really quickly and you'll have to dig it out again next year. So actually you haven't saved yourself anything and will contribute, in fact, to flooding. Um, so it's just re-educating people and making them understand because at the end of the day, you know, what is the future? The future is lots of hard tarmac, lots of hard surfaces, very little permeable surfaces. It's lots more, you know, intensive rain and, and, and flooding. Um, and we're gonna to have to manage, you know, surface water flooding. So we need to know where is this water going to be stored away from properties and roads? And we need to connect up ponds and ditches. Um, and, you know, they need to be part of the solution I and mean, when possible, you know, let's introduce beavers. So how do water voles and beavers have an impact on flood risk reduction? Well, you know, on a small level, water voles do help with riparian plant dispersal. They, that, that basically helps to stabilise the banks of ditches um, and ponds. And, and these plants prevent erosion and the silting of channels. If you remove water voles, then very quickly one plant will quite often dominate a site. Um, and they also contributed to, you know, continual cutting of that vegetation, allowing different plants to come through and allowing water flow. Um, and beavers are just landscape scale architects. Um, they adapt the environment, their habitat needs, and they really do have huge benefits in holding water back improving water quality and, and creating amazing opportunities for bio, biodiversity improvements. And they are much cheaper and more efficient than we are. You know, my projects, um, we'd spent half a million pounds on a small area and, um, you know, just chuck a couple of beavers in and they have much more subtlety about it. Um, and they just do it innately. It's brilliant. So that's me. I've rambled on. So it's, I don't know if I'm going to now unshare my screen and then I'm hoping there might be some questions in the chat. I've, well, no, idea, I've no idea what time it is. I don't know if I've rambled on. Oh God, I, really, I, have, I do apologise. Right, let's okay, go. Time for a few questions. Okay, I'll thank you very sharing. much. That, that, that was absolutely great. Okay. So, um, so one of the questions I think has been answered that was what was the main predators of water voles? I think we did go into that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mink, unfortunately, and then everything. Everything. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So there's a question. Um, I live by the River Darrant in Kent. Do you have any recommendations to encourage water voles or even rehoming programmes? So I'm not aware that there are rehoming programmes. Um, water voles get very stressed in captivity. Um, and they are the one mammal that really um, can't be sort of tamed, if you like. So if a water vault goes into, is caught by a, um, by a cat and taken into a rescue centre, they normally either release them immediately or put them down because they, they can't be, um, they can't be brought back to health, you know, and they don't cope in captivity. So 
rehoming work because she's reintroduction so they are captive bred in very careful conditions which mimic the wild and actually in wildwood in kent there's a big breeding facility but before water voles can be reintroduced to an area you have to think why aren't they there in the first place that's always the key thing what is it that prevented them from from persisting there is it habitat is the habitat not joined up you know your bit of river might be beautiful but unless there's miles and miles of connected habitat a colony will not persist there they will breed out there due to inbreeding and then you have to look at mink the first thing you would have to think is are there mink here because there's no point reintroducing them Okay, another question. There's a quinquennial review of the Wildlife and Countryside Act at the moment. Are water voles listed as endangered for the purpose of the Act? Um, I, now, there's been a lot of, of chat about this, actually. And I know that there was a worry because water voles have been protected not only under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, but also under the European law. And of course, we've stepped away from that. And a lot of people are worried that water voles, there was a mute, muted point by the government who view water voles as a planning problem and therefore wanted to not have them um, uh, covered by the Act anymore because they want to you know, get rid of all that horrible red tape which involves species and all that business. So there was a muted point actually to remove them, but there's been a huge backlash by um, researchers, academics, and the Chartered Institute for Environmental and Ecological Managers who say they need to stay within the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So as far as I know, they're still in there and there's a big fight for them. So, yeah. Okay, so um, so somebody just made a comment that it's interesting that both water voles and beavers have orange teeth. Yes, yes, and that's because they have to be able to um, peel bark off trees, and I think that's it. That's why they've evolved that that ferrous oxide on the front. Yep. Um, okay, so we've just got a few messages saying thank you for a great and interesting talk. So that's great. So I think Jane Jane has um, told you that, um, so with our beaver, our North American beaver, which is obviously the, the different species, um, yeah, we, we x-rayed it and it had a baculum, which is also called the North penis, which is, is also dogs have one, cats don't, but dogs have one. Oh. And um, from that, we were able to sex it and it was male. So it went for its, its, <laughs> its home. <laughs> so yeah. But it's, it's a very interesting thing that um, they've got a cloaca because that's normally more something you would find in a bird or a reptile, isn't it? Yeah. A cloaca. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so um, it looks like there's no further questions there. Lovely. So, yeah. So um, so I, I found that very, very interesting. I'm hope, hoping everybody else did. So um, on behalf of Kent Surrey Sussex RSB, I'd like to thank Jane very much. Thank you.